Yeah, so I I'm, I'm work as an agricultural consultant. So we fly all over the country and work internationally with different farmers and startups of people who are trying to start farms. And a big part of that is starting with um, soil testing. So we do microbial soil testing. We also help interpret uh, chemical and mineral soil testing as well. And then we help to implement holistic management and lean practices into farms to help them become more efficient and also uh, have meet their ecological goals. So this is really the essence of, of what we do. And I, I think after all these years, you're the first like consultant we've had on. Most of the time we will meet a consultant and it's like, I'm not sure what this guy's consulting, but mm -hmm. I've, I've actually just, we followed you for at least the last year and looking at your resources of what you have going on. I think there's a lot that you're offering that I haven't seen anybody else do. And it's just such a total package. So I'm thrilled to be sitting with you. We met online, met, we met for the first time today, but I think we came in contact about a year ago. You were building one of our kits yeah. on one of your farms yeah. in Arizona. Yep. Yeah, we were, uh, we were putting up a 60 foot tunnel in Arizona for a farm we were working with. So we're doing a full farm build out there. We did uh, post harvest, pre harvest, washing stations, field production. They had about a hundred tree uh, orchard that we helped rejuvenate. We added a uh, hundred chickens, built four mobile chicken coops for them and uh, set up all of the infrastructure for that farm, um, including one of your tunnels and also some uh, caterpillar tunnels from another company as well. And that's, that's a lot for somebody to first uh, get into it. What was their kind of background as they, before they came to you? So they already had the land and, um, so they had some experience kind of growing up around the land and doing some farming, but were not by any means career farmers. They, um, so the husband had grown up in Missouri. His family did big industrial style farming, you know, corn, soybean style farming. And that's, it was his understanding of it. So he knew tractors and he knew all of that and was really into old tractors. But, um, his wife had, grown up on the land and had worked with the trees and they hadn't really done any serious farming until we got there and um but their background was in manufacturing so they had uh they did custom manufacturing for military contracts and, and things like that in, in arizona working with the Tesla and all kinds of different companies like that. So they um, were at right about about to retire and they wanted to do something with their land and they wanted to turn it into a functional farm. So that's what uh, what we did for them. It sounds like they hit all the all the high points. I I think about everything that you just said and an orchard being its own complete ecosystem that is totally unlike anything else out there in farming, plus under the tunnels, plus the protein. Right. Uh, that's a lot to cover. Um, right. And that that's why I like the approach of the things that you do and what we're going to talk about. Um, you, wrote an, you wrote a blog post or an article about, you know, seven things that you wish people knew about farming before going into it. Right. I think that's the very best use of our time just right. because so much of what you said has resonated on what we talk about on this podcast and just kind of what we believe as a company all the way together. So right. I just would like to go through each one of those points. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a short interview by, yeah, no. by the time we all get done, but there's, there's a lot to cover. Um, seven things isn't that much, but I like the way you've broke those seven things down into some, some very digestible and some not digestible parts right. as in, people may want to put on the brakes and really think about what you're asking of them to think about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wrote that blog post, um, maybe six months ago and I was, I wanted when people came to my website to be able to, whether they worked with me at all, leave with some meaningful information and, and learn something just by visiting the website. And it's really my gift to everyone who comes and sees the website is the amount of resources that I put in. It took a lot of time to put together all those resources, but uh, I, I really believe in, in giving back more than I take, and that's one of my ways of doing that. And um, th to be honest, I don't fully remember the blog post verbatim, but I'm sure you're going to ask me about it. Oh, I, got, I got it wrote down, so we'll yeah. figure it out. So. Um, but yeah, so... Um, 
a big part of what we do is when we work with farms, we're looking to get really clear on on goals and context of where they're coming from and and be honest about the reality of some of these things. And that was really where I was coming from with, with the blog post that you mentioned is to address some of the realities of what it's like to be on a farm from a pragmatic place, not just from the romantic lens that we like to look at the right. farm through. Yeah. Well, and that, that has all come from time you have spent on various farms throughout your career. Yeah. Let's just hi highlight some of those right. things that you've done over the last 10, 11, 12 years. So I started out farming as 18 years old, and we were doing about 15 acres of production, a friend of mine. And um, we had an old 1943 Farmall tractor. We were doing row cropping, and there was an orchard on site. And we were doing landscaping to help support the farm as well. So we were building irrigation systems, doing hardscaping, doing a lot of different landscaping during the day to help support the farm and but we were doing um, two farmers markets a week we were selling to multiple restaurants and we were we were making profit but we weren't making enough to really make a, a good living right um, so I did that for several years and in that same time frame I started working I stopped doing so much landscaping and I started working at an apple orchard and it was a, an orchard that had 100-year-old trees, and the person who I was working with was doing it for over 30 years. So he had a lot to show me, and he was a very skilled person and very, very meticulous about the process of how we bring the harvest to fruition from fruit trees, the pruning, the thinning, the picking, all the way vertically integrated to making cider and marketing cider. And... I was doing that and doing the vegetable farm at the same time for about four years straight. And I was working full time on the orchard, so I'd wake up four in the morning, do all my chores around the vegetable farm, go get to the orchard by nine, be off by five, go turn the lights on on the tractor and farm all night, you know, as long as I could. And being a young guy, I had the kind of energy to, you know, to be able to do that. Right. And... Doesn't and, last forever, does it? No. <laughs> um, but in that time frame, I was really blessed to have really great mentors and have the ability to make some mistakes, you know, and learn some of the really hard lessons that the reality of how difficult it can be to farm and, and all of the things that are involved with that. And from there, I helped to build several other farms. So I had gone on a trip around the world as I, so the really great thing about working on an apple orchard is you get winters off, it's seasonal work. So I would go travel and go visit farms around the world when I was, had my winters off. And I had a lot of time to think while I was doing that. So I came back from my trip and realized, you know, I don't really want to work on the apple orchard anymore. I want to go do something else. And um, by putting that out there into the universe, I was approached to build another farm, vegetable farm. So we built a one acre market garden that was feeding into a restaurant. It was a true farm to table concept where we weren't really selling a lot. Everything was filtering directly into a restaurant. And I did that for about a year. And we established the whole market garden, established orchards there, irrigation systems. and. Um, they haven't continued on with that. It just didn't make sense to their model. And, but in, the, in doing that, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how those kinds of systems could work and some of the limitations that we had. And when I stopped doing that, I went back to doing landscaping. And I was designing irrigation systems for really big properties, residential, and also for farms and vineyards. And did that for a while, and then I was approached again to build another farm. And we were building a farm for a nonprofit organization. And working for a nonprofit organization is a lot different than working for other organizations. And in doing that, I was, you know, truly had to really boot, bootstrap it, <laughs> you know, right. and use a lot of different materials that we had on hand and be very innovative with what we had because 
we didn't have a ton of funds, but we did have a really meaningful project. Well, I think that gives you an opportunity to learn so much about the flexibility that farming really affords right. the operators, whether that's flexibility in understanding the season or the crops right. or their market or how to do any number of things on the farm that a lot of people want to put in a box. This is the only way that you can or right. can't do something. Right. And I think you've found a series of fundamentals that people can use as a truth and then find their own way through those guideposts. Absolutely. And on that farm, the really great thing about it, because we weren't a farm for profit, I was able to experiment with a lot of stuff. We were able to try a lot of things to see if they worked or not. And I learned a lot there and was able to really learn to innovate even on a higher level than I'd ever done before because I had to. I was forced to, to work with what we had. So I spent over three years on this farm building out everything, building out the irrigation systems, adding walk-in coolers and washing stations, setting up workflow. But also I got to teach a lot because we had interns that would come to the farm. I had six interns under me at one point. And when you begin to have to teach, you become, you learn even more yourself because you're constantly reiterating the basics to others, right? And it really ingrains them into yourself. And it was really great for me to do that. Well, I always feel like something as simple as a wash pack station, nobody's thinking about that. Whenever, you know, it's, it's so easy to get excited about digging in the dirt, planting seeds, pulling the crop, and then you pull the crop. It's like, what am I going to do with this? Right. You know, this harvest that right. we now have to package and clean up. Right. And I, and I think that's where having somebody like you come in, you know, you've been to multiple farms all over the place. You've seen what farms need, don't need. Right. You know, you. I'm sure you've seen some excess. Absolutely. That is unnecessary, but <laughs> absolutely. sometimes you want what you want. Yeah. And um, what I'd come to realize working on all the different farms that I'd worked on, you know, working on farms where we, we didn't have a walk-in cooler, we didn't have proper places to wash stuff. It's a when lot you, of extra work. It's a lot of extra work. And I'd come to realize that the post-harvest and the pre-harvest are really the most important parts of the farm. They're, without them, you will not succeed. You will not be able to scale. Well, it's so, it's so critical on a timeline. You've, you've got a long time to plant seeds. You've got a long time for it to grow out. From the second you cut that thing, I mean, we're talking about just an hour tops to get this thing washed and Right. properly stored properly stored for safety yeah and uh you know i learned a lot about that in my time farming especially farming in arizona where it's really hot so i was one of the top producers of specialty um you know cut greens you know uh, lettuce crops in northern arizona and we sold at all the farmers markets we were selling to restaurants and it can be pretty challenging to grow greens through the summertime and to be consistent with something like that in a really harsh, hot environment. And a big part of being able to succeed with that is being able to be super efficient from getting that out from the field and into the cooler as fast as possible. Right. So I spent a lot of time analyzing these systems of how can I cut out steps and make this as efficient as possible. And then... I, you know, I was introduced to the to lean practices. The book, The Lean Farmer by Ben Hartman was fundamental to me because now it, it put a rhyme and reason and words to what I was already doing. It's fundamental and fun to read. And it's a, it's a great book. Absolutely. And it, and it really ex expanded upon what I was already doing and, and, and affirmed and solidified that what I was doing was actually really meaningful and meant something. And... You know, so I, I put a lot of focus on analyzing complex systems, which is really what a farm is. There's many complex components of it that work in unison as a whole. And when we can begin to break those down and understand them, then we can find the inefficiencies. We can reach our holistic goals, reach our environmental goals. And a farm should make money, you know, or... You, you're not really doing it. You're not really a farm at that point. You're a garden. Right, <laughs> right. Um, so 
in my experiences working on these various different projects and different farms, um, most recently we were building the farm in uh, Clarkdale, Arizona called Bent River Farm, the one where we threw, put the tunnel up. And that we were able to execute what would have took me years before within six months because I could see it all clearly. I could see like, we need post-harvest. That's where it's going to go. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to put this here. Well, it had to start with, as you walked on that bare land, knowing where, knowing everything that you needed to know and imagining where it should be in relationship to that land. Right. And that's a huge leg up. Absolutely. And we were blessed to be working with people that had the capital to be able to make it happen fairly quickly. Right. And Oh, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, so in doing that, we, we did, we continued to learn a lot. And I learn on every single farm that I work on. I learn new things. There is no one size fit all approach to building a farm. You need to be flexible and your context is everything. I'm curious, as you have worked in other farms outside of the United States, what's some fundamental differences that they do in their approach versus how people are coming to you now here as a retirement income or a second job, or, you know, maybe, maybe they're leaving their regular nine to five versus over there. I would imagine that's a lot of legacy family farms and, um, you know, part necessity, but I I imagine it's just totally different. I'm interested to hear just some of your reflections on that. So I've worked with a lot of farms in Kenya and in Kenya, a lot of the work we were doing was more humanitarian aid work, you know, um, helping to grow farms so people can eat more so than to make money, right? So when we're going over there, one thing that's really um, fundamental when working with other cultures or working with farms outside of the country or, or any work in any regard outside of the country is to begin to understand their culture, you know, and where they're coming from. So I spent a lot of time sleeping on the ground in a mud hut and eating beans and rice and and living the way that they live to begin to understand how i could best help them right and um and i I would imagine that would help just the acceptance of you being there and who's this guy all of a sudden and yes you know being will being willing to you know live as they live it had to open up everybody's eyes oh yeah and they um you know, they're much more receptive and, and, and much more respectful when you treat them with that level of respect of trying to understand and live the way that they live. So a lot of what we were doing when we were in Kenya was trying to help come up with ways to supplement needing to buy fertilizer, right? So a lot of the work that I've done on all the farms that I've worked on is making a lot of my own microbial inputs, making a lot of our own fertilizers. And I've progressed with that even more. Now, in that time frame, I did not use the microscope. Now I do, you know, and I can confirm my work. Where when we were doing it, and in that time frame, I didn't have those skills, but I knew that what we did worked, right? So we were going over there and finding ways to help them set up worm farms, basic composting finding ways to make fermentations, to make basic fertilizers using the weeds and the grass growing on their property. We can make fertilizer out of these things. And it's easy and it saves a lot of money and is going to give higher yields because really the end result when we were working with these farms was not to necessarily make money, it was to grow more food and to do it more efficiently so you could feed more children and more people, right? I can't help but imagine that the, uh, the crops are just appreciated so much more than somebody that's, hey, let's go to the farmer's market before we go to the store, before we go out to eat. You know, it's a, it's a whole nother level of oh, appreciation for the, for the crop. Absolutely. I mean, someone in Kenya, I mean, they'll eat a tomato that's already got a bite out of it, you know, or has mold growing on it because they know that the other half of it's good. Right. <laughs> you know, it's um, when you're hungry, it's a whole different deal. Um, so we worked with a lot of farms to help increase efficiencies in greenhouses, helped make different fertilizers, helped introduce irrigation systems because using irrigation is not even commonplace on many of the smaller farms that we worked with because they get there's only three months out of the year that they don't get rain. So 
using irrigation in the dry season does allow them to grow more food, but it's not necessarily something that's commonplace or, or understood. So right. we help to introduce basic drip irrigation, things like this, so that in that dry period, they can continue to produce food. Also, basic. Um, you just run down to Home Depot and get that stuff. <laughs> no, we didn't go. We had to special order it from India. <laughs> but um, we also uh, did use basic greenhouse management techniques, help them to keep their greenhouses cleaner or find unique ways to use ventilation or other techniques of, of trellising to get more efficiencies within their greenhouses so that they could grow more food. And this was like for me was really meaningful work because it allowed me to be innovative it allowed me to help people who were in need and for me to not really be getting anything out of it like doing it without expectation is really a, a beautiful thing and to see the appreciation and, and to be able to call up these people and see like yeah, they're still making worm compost they're making the fertilizers that we showed them how to make and that they they appreciate it and it really meant a lot to them and it's probably being passed down at this point yeah it, it is and so in working with farms internationally that's really you know a different tier of my work so we work on a sliding scale with our consulting business because we want to be able to help people at all levels, meaning at some times, absolutely for free <laughs> because it's truly needed. And we can make enough with our other clients that we're able to offset these things and be able to give back more than we're taking. It means a lot and it's a core part of our, our business model. As you can imagine, we have one or two phone calls a day where people are just starting out and um, you know, they're coming from all walks of life, all different personality types, um, various reasons, whether that's health or a sustainability aspect or uh, community building. A lot of these are right in this uh, article that we're going to put a link down at the bottom, make sure people can read it. But as people approach you, the first thing that you have them do is really tell you, in a clear way what their goals are. Right. I would imagine that at some point when you point blank ask them that, maybe they don't even know. They have an idea, but when you really ask them, what are you really trying to do here, that that may be cause for pause. That's very true. More often than not, they don't fully ha have a conceptual idea of what it is they're trying to do or a clear mission statement. They definitely haven't written one down. It's the majority of the farms that I work with do not have a written down mission statement. And that's fundamental, you know. Well, it's like farming has this low barrier to entry. It, right. Anybody with a, a garden can become a farmer sure. in various, you know, scales of, of degree with so many people doing so many different things and so many different ways of considering yourself a farm. It's, I think it's easy to go in head first. Oh, absolutely. And, and to some extent, you need to. You know, that type of attitude is necessary to succeed as a farmer. But being clear on your goals. So it's really important to be super clear on your goals because a farm being a complex system, you're going to get to the point where things are going to get a little crazy on the farm once you really start getting going. And any farmer who's really good at what they're doing at some point or another has asked themselves, why am I doing this, right? And when you ask yourself that question, where are you supposed to go? You go back to your mission state. You go back to your holistic context, which means a triple bottom line, people, profit, planet. What am I really trying to affect? What are my metrics of how I'm keeping track of this? And where do I go back when things get crazy? So when I'm working with a farm, I ask a lot of questions. It's almost surprising to people how many questions I ask. They expect me to go there and tell them what to do. But I can't tell you what to do without asking a ton of questions and getting clear on what it is you're actually trying to do. Because there is no one size fit all to creating a farm. Or how long does it take on this line of questioning before people realize that the other, you know, the whole other side of this equation is the community that they're going to be serving. It usually takes about a full day 
of asking questions and getting really clear on these things before it starts to drive in. And it usually takes a few days of really uh, thinking on it and nibbling on that a little bit for it to truly sink in of what it is they're getting into and what it actually means to have a farm. And who's it for? Yeah, absolutely. It is uh, it is not for everybody. It's a certain type of person who will succeed in the long term at farming and not find burnout. And you do. it does mean staying organized. It does mean being clear with your goals and, and setting up your infrastructure in a way that it's efficient. And a lot of the time, if you jump in head first without enough understanding of what you're trying to do, you're likely going to set up your infrastructure in a way where you have tons of wasted steps. And because you're not looking at it clearly enough, and you're likely moving too fast from a place of excitement or wanting to jump head first, when making a clear plan, getting clear on what your goals are, then you could really tailor what infrastructure is absolutely necessary, where it should go, how I set up my flows to be able to reach that triple bottom line. I really drive in that on every decision that you make on the farm, you affect the whole and you need to consider, is this pulling me closer to my holistic context or is it pushing me further away? And there's several questions you can ask yourself in doing that. And these are the things that I begin to introduce to people before we ever make recommendations on infrastructure or recommendations on fertility programs or any of that, because the context will vary. You may have different amount of money. You may have different amounts of land or goals or access to help, right? So all of those things are relevant and need to be thought about before you really make any action on building a farm. Ever been an instance in which somebody has an idea in their head that they, they really want to do whatever crop you want to come up with, but it's, it's not the right place, it's not the right crop, it's not the my, right market, and you almost have to be the bad guy to say, look, I get what you're trying to do, but you're going to have to sell this pineapple for $500 for this to make financial sense. Right. And it's okay to have hobbies, but you're not building a hobby here. Right. And I run into that almost 100% of the time. Right. And the way to navigate that is using the 80-20 rule. So you can have 20% of the crops that you think are fun, that you want to grow, and build that into your plan, understanding that that's not going to be your main cash flow, but you can do it because it's enjoyable to you. And it should farming should be enjoyable and fun to you. But 80% of what you're growing should be what your market wants and what you're able to sell and what can drive your business. So I, do, I don't necessarily discourage people from going things that are fun or even innovating or any of these things, but only make it 20% of what you're doing. Maybe even a little bit less. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and I think that you do need room for that so people can feel creative and find enjoyment in what they're doing. So you can't completely eliminate it. You build that into your plan, understanding that that's not how you're going to make money on the farm. This is what you're going to do to find enjoyment, right? Or to maybe come up with new ways of innovating and so a big part of what we do is lean practices. And within lean practices, room to innovate is part of that, right? But how many materials do you keep around to innovate? How many junk piles do you need? How many All of the junk piles. How many idle projects do you need to have, right? right? So how do you organize your time? What are you spending the most time on the farm doing? And really where you should be spending your most time is doing things that generate value. How many times did I touch this lettuce? Did I touch it 10 or did I touch it 5 or did I touch it 3? If I touched it 3, that's amazing because I cut out all these steps that weren't actually generating value for my customer, made my life more efficient, and in the end of the day, I made more money because of it. Mm -hmm. And this is the way that we need to look at the farm. We need to look at it critically use practices that are efficient but also fit our context you know like maybe you know you don't you are more focused on quality right so if you're more focused on quality you may not be working as efficiently 
but you can sell your product for a higher price. And you in understanding that, that's how you set your business up. Yes, this takes us a little longer, but this is the result that we get that we're known for. Or maybe you want to sell a lower tier product and you want to save time and you want to make more money. So these are the questions you have to ask in the way you're organizing your time of what is it that we're really trying to do and how do I want to organize this? Do we want to sell top tier art, artisan style produce? Or do we want to sell produce that's still really good, but it was a little more efficient to produce it? Right. And does the market care one way or the other? Yeah, these are questions to ask. And, you know, a big part of uh, farming is sitting, running numbers, and sitting there running spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are your friend on the farm. They really are. And, and many farmers find this stuff uncomfortable because more often than not, Farmers, especially if they're just getting going, or even long-term farmers, are not accounting for their own time as much as they should. Right. You know, they, they don't like looking at the numbers because they realize they're making $5 an hour, right? And so they avoid doing that and, and say this is a labor of love and this is just the reality of the way that it is. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. And sitting and running those numbers will allow you to come from a place of honesty so we can make improvements and we can move out of that and all of a sudden have time to have a life to spend time with your family or go have fun right that's that's the perfect way to introduce the next thing on my list which is one of the things i read was you have them go through their goals whether that's personal an environmental goal an economic goal or community goal realizing that your time is worth more than five dollars an hour up front and being able to work your way towards that, you know, realizing that I want to get into this because I want to be better for the planet. How are we going to set up infrastructure to not waste water, to not have single-use pl uh, plastics? The personal goals, yeah, maybe this is a much better nine-to-five job, but you still want to have time to take your kids to soccer practice. Right. I mean, these are these are all things that it's so easy to get wrapped up in how exciting it is to start a new business and get business cards made and t-shirts made and all the, all the fun stuff. But when you've cut out everything else, how quickly do you have to look back to go, well, I made a mistake here. Yeah. I mean, you could easily get into like a, some type of an identity crisis of like, Oh, I became a farmer. And now I'm nothing else. I thought I was a dad and I thought I liked to play music or I thought I liked to do this and that. And and a farm, if, Forget it's, travel. If, if not organized properly, you don't have time for those things anymore. But if organized properly, you can still have a life outside of the farm because you've set it up with the intention of doing that from the beginning. Oh, and I think you setting this up first as a way to, to make that as part of the larger plan, that's one of the things that I I rarely, rarely see people do. Yeah. So that's... It's one of my favorite things about the article, actually, is to is to have that personal time. I appreciate that, and like, I I came to realize this from from personal experience. You know, out there working inefficiently, not having time, reaching burnout, even as a young guy. You know, it's if farmers. I mean, if you're going to become a farmer, you're likely a pretty ambitious person, and and you think that you can do a lot, and, and, and you can, because you're a powerful person. But And even if you don't think you can do a lot, you can. Because that's, that's what we get a lot is, I, I'm scared to start. I don't know. You know, what about this? What about that? Right. And we just keep encouraging people just to get out there and do and just try it, right. and you'll be all right. And the reality is, is you could take a fraction of that energy <laughs> if organized properly, and achieve way more when being able to identify what is actually generating value and what is a form of waste on my farm. And leaning up your farm and having a clean farm where you have room to think, all of the clutter around the farm eats up mental space and you're not able to think clearly. Right. That, that's a fundamental, you know, and more often than not, the amount of time that's ate up from walking back and forth to the tool shed when you could have tools where you use them, you know, simple things like this save a lot of time and end up saving a lot of money. 
We talked about it earlier. Um, I, I talked about somebody that they didn't want to grow a trial crop because they didn't want to waste the seed. Right. Well, now they've wasted six weeks of time that you should have worked that into your budget anyway. Right. right. That's not a waste. What is a waste is the waste of time of not learning or a waste of growing something and not having a place to sell it. That's the waste. Right. You know, timing is everything on a farm. If you don't time your stuff properly and you're not on it and you have your thumb on the pulse of that farm, you're you're not going to do everything that you think you're going to do. But if you're in touch and you have metrics to keep track of this stuff and you're organized, then you can be very profitable and you can have a life and you can do these things. But there is an inherent level of risk that's involved with farms that you need to understand from the beginning. If any farm, no matter how good you're, you are at this, you're gambling to an extent. We can't control weather. We can't control insects. We can sway it in our direction. We can make good calculated gambles, but it's a gamble nonetheless. And some years you're going to win and some years you're going to lose. Absolutely. And, and you should have these things set up within your spreadsheets and your books to be able to account for when these mistakes may happen and to be able to maximize your efficiencies and also have a farm that's somewhat diversified. So when one thing is down, another is up and it balances out. And we spend a lot of time helping farms to diversify and have multiple enterprises. So. When you look at a farm, yes, it's one thing, but an orchard is one enterprise. Chickens are another. Microgreens are another. Your lettuce or your fruit crops, all of these are individual enterprises. And when you look at the numbers on them, you should look at them individually. So how much did tomatoes make this year? How much did microgreens make? So that we can then run them as individual enterprises. And this is the true holistic way of running your numbers for the farm and will allow us to progress. We need metrics for every single thing, or we don't know where we are, and we can't really truly progress without it. You know, and That's coming from a place of honesty, which is really important in any aspect of life, is just coming from a place of honesty and understanding of where we are, this is where we're headed, this is what's going to get us there, and be able to have checks and balances along the way. Right? The second thing that you ask folks to think about is what are they good at? Which maybe not everybody's great at growing carrots, but it's in their plan. When they may be really good at growing whatever, um, the chickens, the animals, beekeeping, making your own fertilizer, you're not expecting anybody to be an expert or good at any one of those things. Right. No, not at all, you know, and everyone is going to find different things on the farm that are exciting to them or really what they love doing and being able to identify those things is critical. But also when you have a team, being able to identify what people's talents are so that you can best utilize them. Underutilized talent is a form of waste. So being able to put people where they're going to thrive where are you going to thrive on the farm? Do you ever ask yourself this question, right? So what do I want to spend my time doing? What should I delegate to others? How can I make this an enjoyable life for everybody? It's right? the classic case of I want, to, I want to get out of the rat race. I want to start a farm. I don't want to have to deal with people. And then every Saturday I have to go and deal with the public at the farmer's markets, and I can't stand it. It's right. this weird juxtaposition of attaining a goal and then being forced to sustain that goal by doing something you just completely despise. And right. we see it. You can go to any farmer's market tomorrow and see that example. And when I work with farms, especially startup farms, I make these things clear like, okay, you're the farm owner. What do you actually want to do? Do you just want to finance the farm and someone else runs it? Do you actually want a farm? Do you want to run the books? Do you want to do markets? What is it that you're trying to do as the farm owner? And there's no wrong answer to that. No, any of those could be great. If you don't want to run the farm, then you need a good manager. And you need someone who can manage others in a meaningful way, right? And maybe you just want to come walk around the farm once in a while and, and allow others to do it and provide opportunity. Right. Or you want to be the one out there doing it. You know, Being clear on this in the beginning 
is super important so that you can live the life that you want to live. Like ask yourself when you get into the farm, what lifestyle do I really want to live? What's going to make me happy? What's going to make my family happy? And what's going to, how do I need to organize this that I can reach my economic goals, my environmental goals, and how I affect my community, my family, and my employees, right? And likely you want to do something that's meaningful in all those regards. And having ability to check in and numbers to run and metrics to see like, am I doing these things? And when you are, it feels really good. And you have proof of it, right? I like the way this list kind of like piggybacks off the, the next one piggybacks off the, the, the next one. And so this is my favorite quote of the whole thing. And I, I don't know if it, you meant for this to be a quote, but that's, I'm, I'm calling it a quote. Sure. So it's a quote. Every moving part affects the whole, especially you. And I really believe that as a farm owner, you're right at the center of this wheel spoke where everything does matter. And for you to put that focus back on this farm owner to do exactly what we just talked about is to figure out what they're best at and delegate the rest. That's pretty, that's a pretty profound statement, I believe. I, I appreciate that. And you know, it, it goes even, even deeper than that. From my perspective, like we, a farm is a living ecosystem. A farm has many aspects of life. The soil is life. The plants are life. We contain life, right? This is something that is, we have in common with the farm. This is something we share. And when we can begin to understand that, that we and this farm are really the same thing and that we, what we do and the decisions we make affect the whole and they affect our life and they affect the ecology around the farm. So being connected with this and having this understanding is really important, especially if you're trying to be quote unquote regenerative farm, right? Having metrics and understanding of when I do this, this happens, right? When I do this, this happens and it affects the whole. I read where you stated that both beneficial and you know, quote unquote harmful insects, they have to eat. It's their job to eat. It's wildlife's job to survive and eat. And if that means coming on their farm, that's part of the system and that's part of the cycle. Bringing animals onto the farm, you brought to light that it was a 24-hour day, seven days a week, 365. And now, as much as we want to care for our plants, it's just an extra added responsibility to care for an animal who, at the same time, is being raised for a purpose. Right. Yeah, I mean, having animals on the farm is a big deal. That's And people do jump into that too quickly, not realizing that, oh, I got to be there to close the chickens. I got to be there to open them up. I got to be there to feed them and water them. And if I want to leave, I got to find someone to look after them now. And oh, I got to lift these 50 pound sacks of feed all the time. And I got to do this and that. And it is a tremendous responsibility, but also brings tremendous value to the farm in so many ways. You add something like chickens, a core tenet of permaculture is to stack functions. A chicken serves many, many functions to the farm. It's part of your fertility program. It's part of your pest management program. It's part of your waste management program. You're able to feed these chickens almost anything and turn it into a source of fertility. And then also you get eggs. This is a fourth, a source of revenue for you. But chickens tend to not be super high value in terms of eggs. The margins are very slim on eggs, but you get all of these other things out of the chickens. And if that's something that you want to do, you need to understand the responsibility that's involved with that. This is a living thing. These share a life with me and are really an extension of me, like what your children would be, or even the microbial life in your soil is an extension of you. They're your underground livestock, right? And it's such a good way to put the true value of what that one input would be. Right. You know, it, okay, yeah, we didn't do great on eggs, but look at all the other benefits that we got that we would have had to pay for or we would have had to labor for. Absolutely. You know, so these are things to look at is sometimes there are these built-in 
inefficiencies in some of the things that we do, but they have other inherent value. So being able to identify value and waste and look at that from a pragmatic place and a realistic place of, yes, the chickens don't make the most money. They pay for themselves at least, and they bring all of these other things. But also, if it's a huge time commitment to be there, to be able to look after them. So when you organize the workflows on your farm, you have to be realistic of, yes, I want all of these things from the chickens. And yes, I'm willing to put this time in to get it, right? And, you know, and the eggs are really like a byproduct of all of the other things that the chickens are doing for you. The eggs are not going to be a huge money maker for you unless you go way big scale, minimum 100 chickens to be able to make any amount of money with eggs. And it also may be that lost leader that that's the reason somebody stops at your stand is to get the eggs, but then they wind up purchasing or finding out about you oh, for while sure. they're there. That, that's been a big part of farms that I've worked on. Eggs have got me into a lot of restaurants. You know, you can get in with the eggs and then they see everything else that you got that's the real money maker for you. Eggs are definitely draw people's attention. So the next thing you had was farming as a business. A lot of people um, get out of farming or get out of their current situation to get into farming because they don't want to be on a computer anymore. And now we're sitting here and you're telling them it's going to be a vital part of their farm success is to get on these spreadsheets and get organized. Oh, absolutely. I mean, spreadsheets are absolutely your friend on the farm. And these spreadsheets have the ability to help you remain organized and to keep you on track. And without them, I mean, you could keep notes in a notebook or you could do things analog, but then you end up with when you're looking at long-term data on your farm, it's very inefficient to sift through a bunch of paper. It's going to take you a bunch of time when you could have it streamlined. Like my envelopes on, here. Yeah, you, could, <laughs> you could have it streamlined on the computer. You could access it from your phone. Or all of these types of things create efficiencies on the farm. And spending time in front of the computer is necessary. And you don't necessarily need to you know, be, spend all of your time in front of the computer and, and you shouldn't, you should build other things into it because you started farming because you likely want to spend time in nature. You want to work with the land, you know, and, and you should build the time to do that. But someone on the farm needs to keep track of the numbers or you're not going to be able to progress in a meaningful way. It's super important. How, how have you seen couples or business partners? One wants to grow, one's great at the computer. How are they navigating, you know, one guy one guy's out there working in the heat and somebody else is in the air conditioner working at the computer. Does that cause any troubles or is there a way to to kind of beat that before it starts? I mean that that happens for sure. I mean, likely you know, when I'm working with farms, there's one person who likes spending time in front of the computer and there's a person who doesn't. You know, I'm talking to usually not just one person when we're going and starting a farm and there, you know, there can be conflict involved with that for sure, but you need to design the farm in a way where there is cross pollination and people are able to participate in all levels of tasks. You know, the person who doesn't like making spreadsheets should at least be aware that the spreadsheets exist and look at them, right? right? <laughs> she doesn't have to make them. Why are we doing this? <laughs> right. And so that there's a reference point for everybody. And the person who's there making the spreadsheets should be aware of how the workflows work to help optimize these spreadsheets, right? Right. And everyone does have to have an understanding of how all things work so that they can progress together. And, hey, this, this little th aspect of the spreadsheet didn't work with our workflow. Could you change it? You know, this would be more efficient for us to do it this way. And being able to have those conversations where people aren't feeling siloed or feeling trapped in a role, they're working together in unison, realizing that they all are part of the farm and they affect it. And they're really, in a, in a way, one thing, working in unison together, right? The very first thing you had people do was take a look at their goals. And then you remind them that, you know, this thing is a business. The next thing on your list was, how can we structure the business to fit the goals? Yeah. I think that's brilliant the way that you're just leading them to the natural 
what this is supposed to be and what it, what it's supposed to look like if somebody has personal goals, if somebody has goals of rehabbing a piece of land, you know, how does that fit or how can that fit into the business book? Yeah, so people start farms for a lot of different reasons. You know, sometimes maybe you're in retirement and you're not really starting the farm because you need the money. Maybe you only care if the farm breaks even and it pays for itself, right? Maybe you want to start a nonprofit organization where people can make donations or offer volunteer programs. Or maybe you want to make a for-profit business that's going to make some money for you, right? So these are things to really think about. A farm, at least a nonprofit farm, still has to make money, which is to at least break even. But the way you get the money is completely different. You know, on a nonprofit farm, you solicit money. And when, doing doing a good thing and making a profit is not mutually exclusive. You can do both. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, so these are questions to really ask. Do you want to be the type of farm that solicits donations? Or do you want to be the type of farm that goes and grows your stuff and you make your own money, right? So these are things to really think about because a lot of the time when I encounter people who are wanting to start a farm, there's a lot of ideology involved with this of like why they're actually getting into doing it and a lot of ambiguous ideas and, oh, we want to have a camp or we want to do this or we want to do that, you know, and like real, you need to realize that each one of these things is actually its own separate enterprise and is a bigger picture of the whole, but what is it going to take to do that and what's the best way that I should structure the business to accommodate that, right? Right. Well, I love it. The fifth thing, I hate putting numbers on these, but okay. I, f I feel like this keeps us on track. Yeah. You really can't control Mother Nature. There's things that you can do. You talked a little bit about it earlier about, you know, you can place bets and you can make things more in your favor. But at the end of the day, we do have different seasons. Everybody can adjust their crops. Everybody can realize that, hey, it's fixing to get real hot. Do we have our shade? Is the irrigation repaired now right. and before it's too late and there's water on the ground? I always make the joke that, you know, everybody has access to a calendar. Let's, let's try to use it every now and then to realize what next month is right. so they can, you know, be prepared for it. Right. Um, you know, how, how are you writing that into some of these systems? Yeah, so um, calendars are a big part of farming. And, you know, a good farmer has a long gaze. You know, they're able to look far out on where they're headed and be able to put a point and aim themselves at it. You know, much like we we're on the tractor to drive a straight line, you got to aim yourself at something far out in the distance, you know, and you got to keep your eye on it. And on the farm, you do need to set these key points. You need to set landmarks and you need to be aware of your environment. You need to understand around this time of year, this insect's going to be here. This time of year, the weather gets like this, you know, and you need to be in touch. A good farmer is an engineer, an artist. It's all of these things, you know, and a scientist, you know, and that's one of the really amazing things that's kept me with farming is how dynamic it is. So you need to be able to be dynamic and look at your farm from many angles. If you have an insect, the best way to deal with an insect is to understand its life cycle and its habits and what it eats, what it doesn't like, you know, and understanding when that life cycle is going to start so when you so you can be prepared for these things and it's all about that long gaze and setting points and the more time you spend in an area the better you can do this and also asking questions to seasoned farmers in the area what are your planting dates when are you starting pest management you know all of these types of things and marking them on your calendar and having an ability to keep track of these things. I think being aware that some of those mentors may not call it pest management. Oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Run into that a couple of times. Right. Prepare to have systems for unpredictability. Right. That could mean several things to several people. Maybe they have some extra supplies. Maybe they have a better maintenance program for their equipment. Right. Yeah, so... It does mean a lot of different things and like it's all about context. So a lot of the time when you're dealing with different infrastructure on the farm, having fail safes, you know, having the ability to have some level 
of redundancy that's not excessive, right? Having extra tools, having extra plastic for your greenhouse is a great idea. Having extra seed, you know, having growing 30% more than you actually need right. in, in case failure happens, you know? So that's all based on context of what your farm may encounter or what your environment may bring to you. So being light on your feet and understanding the variability of life as we know it and the variability of what a farm can be and what the unexpected, like to expect the unexpected to some extent, right? And build that into your plan and into your mind of like, things may happen that I'm not expecting and, and knowing that and being true about it. For people that, maybe me, just get up, pound coffee, and just get after it, you know, they're 100 miles an hour all the time. How would you encourage them or direct them to have a little bit more mindfulness to where they're like, stopping and observing and really taking it in without, you, know, you don't have to do all the time, man. It's, it's a good time to sit back and look at something. Yeah, I mean, I think that in the mornings on the farm, getting up early enough to give yourself time to be a human being, you know, to, to sit and maybe reflect a little bit and give yourself that extra time before you need to get out there on the farm. Because once you get out there on the farm, you know, you're probably going to be out there all day and you may run into things that you didn't expect. So setting that time at the beginning of the day to set yourself right and make sure that you're good and you ate something and you drank enough water and that you're wearing the right clothing for the day and all of these things are, are really critical. That way you're easing into your day and you feel like you've achieved a lot before you even went out there, right? You're not feeling like your personal stuff is lacking because you had to start grinding and you didn't, you didn't eat proper breakfast or you didn't get a shower or you didn't do these kinds of things. And when you can move in, like ease into the day like that, and have a strategic plan of what you want to do for the day. These are my key tasks and have them written down somewhere or in your phone and the ability to check them off. Have these key lily pads through your day where I'm going to hit here and I'm going to hit here. And then you can work efficiently and that will give you the time to stop and pay attention because you've made a proper plan and you've given yourself the time to be a human being and before you went and jumped right into being a farmer right as i continue to read i was very delighted that you got super jedi on me <laughs> so you made the statement that attachment is the root of suffering and a farm is a powerful teacher to the circle of life and being able to let go right pretty profound because uh, it happens all day every day on a farm and um, i think for people just getting into that they may not be aware that this is on the horizon and they're going to have to deal with a crop failure or a dead animal or a beehive collapse or something right. like that. Yeah, that's that's a real reality is that we, it's very easy to become attached. I, I see people when they're first starting and going at farming being attached to kale plants and stuff like that. It's like, man, plant another kale plant. Like when you begin to Stop realize Stop naming the chickens, right, man. <laughs> when you begin to realize the process of life that we're all in a process of death and renewal on all levels. You know, like a plant is going to start from a seed and it's going to go through its process and it's going to make flowers and fruit and it's going to drop them and it's going to die. You need to know that it's going to die and and be prepared for that and make your timing of everything you do conducive to being able to knowing that it's going to die and I'm going to replace it and you have a process and you know and then realizing like when you're working with animals that all of them are going to die at some point or another and that but when you treat them with care and with understanding that this is something of sustenance this is something of beauty that this is how I feed my family this is how we make money this is something important and meaningful and that it, really the, the fact that it comes to an end in a way is beautiful because that's the way everything is working. It's, and we're no different. We're not, we're not separate of that. Right. Right. Last thing, preparing them 
to be prepared to ask for help. That's really hard. And um, that's something I've experienced myself being very difficult at asking for help because when you get into farming, you have all these ideas, you know, tied up in it and they're all cool to you and you kind of want to do them all yourself. And it can be really easy to feel like no one's going to do it the way that you're going to do it or you know, oh, I have to be the one to do it because I'm the only one that does it this way, you know, or, and that's a re recipe for disaster. You're just asking to eat up all of your time now and becoming comfortable with the fact that, no, they're not going to do it the same way as you. But if you take the time to show them how to do it right and they care about it and you treat them with respect, they're probably going to do it good enough, right? And they're going to do it their way and they're and leaving space for people to be able to find their own way of doing things and not micromanaging over them and leaving space for yourself to know that it's okay to ask for help, right? And like, because you're going to need to, you have to delegate if you want to be able to scale a farm or be able to run any kind of business because you can't do it all on your own. We need help. We need community. A farm is nothing without community. And part of that community is your employees. You know, they're, they're in a way part of your, your family. They're part of the farm and they're necessary. I loved how you're already preparing people to either have an employee or, and this is a big distinction, a paid intern. Right. The fact that you are having them think about this now, they may be months from it, they may be a couple of years from it, but we all get old, we all <laughs> slow down a little bit, we do need that vacation every right. now and then and have that personal time. The only way that I see to do that, if you're going to have any type of skill whatsoever, is to have other folks involved. Absolutely. You know, and a, a paid intern, a, I did make a point to put that in the article, paid. I because, appreciate it. Um, you know, you can, you can, like, you know, volunteers and intern programs, this is a touchy kind of thing, you know, because what kind of value are you really providing to them? You know, you got to ask these kinds of things of like, they're, you know, to an extent they're learning, but they're also like, you cannot run a business, an energetically clean business with people working for free. That can't be your main labor source. That like, if you have a free intern on your farm, they sh you should not rely on them at all to do anything that actually runs the business. Right. They're there to learn. <laughs> You know, so if you want and them, probably screw some stuff up along the way. Sure. And if you are wanting to put any kind of responsibility on an intern, they need to be paid because they then they're going to take some ownership of what they're doing and take pride in it. Where if you're not paying them that that sheen of the excitement of them being on the farm there to learn will diminish over time the more responsibility you put on them. Right. And you're going to end up with someone who's going to be resentful or is going to cause problems for the farm and be way more of an issue than they're worth. And so you do need to treat people with respect. And if you're asking them to do manual labor, that means that you need to put value on their time. You know, like, and running a business on free labor is, and there's, that doesn't exist. It's not a thing. You know, right. like you're not a successful business at that point. A successful business can pay their employees and they can pay them well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to end this now because I think that's the most important part, but we got just a tad bit more hand in hand. And I think as equal as, as a decision it is to hire somebody, it's the ability to let go as an owner and delegate knowing that, that delegation, it's probably not going to be as good as what you did it, but hopefully within the training, it's better than what anybody else is doing out there. Right. And there's, they're never going to meet your full expectations. Right. I mean, how do you get people to wrap your, their head around that? Well, one of the easiest ways to, uh, to do that and constantly coming back to the lean principles is using standard operating procedures. Using S, you know, having the way if you have a washing station, put the picture on the wall of what the washing station is supposed to look like when it is clean. Put it right there. 
eye level where they can see it. And you tell them when you're done, it should look like that. If it doesn't look like that, you didn't do it right. And then you walk away and you give them the opportunity to meet those standards. And you don't delegate them. You give them the space to do what you showed them and you make it obvious what needs to be done. And you put the tools where they need to be and you set the workflows up in a way that they're so efficient that it's almost impossible <laughs> to do it any other way because you'd be stumbling. You know, when you set a farm up efficiently, it's like stepping into a river. You know, the river is already going. You're going to go with it. And when you can set up a really efficient system, it should work that way and there shouldn't be much resistance. And when you set up good standard operating procedures, it should be obvious and the materials should be available to the employees of how they need to do things. And they should always have the opportunity to ask questions and be treated with respect and not be micromanaged, have the room to be a human being and maybe make a couple mistakes and to learn, right? And then they're really going to find pride and they're going to find their own stride and give them the space to be able to analyze the systems themselves and maybe help you improve upon them because they have eyes that you don't have, right? And leaving space for that will allow you to progress and allow the, the farm hands and all of the people helping you to feel empowered and feel proud of their work. So I think it took me maybe 15 minutes to read the article. We've been talking about it for more than an hour, which yeah. I think is great. There's several things I still have here, but I want to leave some meat on the bone for people to go reread this sure. in their own context. So I just want to leave with the one last thing is that, um, you reminded people to be a lifetime learner through research. It never ends. Right. Um, you know, earlier off camera, you and I were talking about, you know, we, we consume a few courses or books throughout the year and we make time to do that and to make time to reflect on it. I know that's made a big change for you. It's obviously made a, a for me, and it's obviously made a big change for you. But um, that mindfulness, that reflectiveness, sitting on the farm, soaking it all in, keeping a journal, passing that along, whether that's through SOP or a helping hand. It's all part of it. Oh, absolutely. You know, like you, you do want to be a lifelong learner and on the farm, it's the farm will humble you every chance it gets. Like there is never any ceasing of learning new things on the farm. Like, and it's a really when you begin to realize that it's really beautiful because you're constantly stimulated with more things to learn about. And like, that's been what's kept me with it for so long as I'm constantly in it for years and years. And it's constantly humbling me realizing like the more I learn about this, the more I realize that I don't really fully understand it. Right. And to come from that perspective is a really great thing because it allows us to continually become better and stronger humans you know a farm has the ability to make us a stronger human being and a, a smarter more resilient human being and if you you want to make time to do those things you want to make time to take courses and read books and reflect and the number one thing that i tell to any farmer any gardener is you must keep a journal the spreadsheets are important that helps you keep track of the business the the journal helps you keep track of yourself, helps you keep track of your thoughts and your spirit and everything that's important and special about the farm. You don't ever want to lose track of that. And you want to write down things that you notice. That way you remember them and you can address them next year. Like, oh, the trees bloomed around this time. You know, I saw this bug or I noticed this little thing, you know, and all of those things are important and allow us to progress and become stronger farmers and better, stronger humans, right? And I really believe that the farm is the ultimate way to get closer to the earth and the ultimate way to become a strong human. And whether it's a garden or a farm, you know, all, both of those have the ability to bring us back down to the earth, back home, really, <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, one of the core things that I really try to drive in with anyone that I talk to. Right. I knew that this was going to be great. Um, you've really, you've taken good care of me today. This is about 
I'm about 20 hours into the day. <laughs> uh, we had some travel issues. You invited me in your home and took care of me, and I loved it. Thank you absolutely so much to both of you. Um, yeah, everybody, I can't encourage you to to go check out your website enough. Uh, we're gonna put all the links down at the bottom to follow you and all that stuff. But yeah, dude, thanks for thanks for having us and for meeting us so late and all that stuff. Yeah, and, I really appreciate it. You know, I I love what you guys are doing and. It really means a lot that you reach out and ask me to do this with you. I'm, I'm the, the recipient of all the good, I promise you that. So well, we'll get out of your hair. I know this will not be the, the first time that we sit down and talk, so the start of something good, and I appreciate it. All right. Yeah. That's it. Wow. That's how we cool. do it. Awesome.